And this will be chapter 14, verse 55 following. Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now the chief priests and the whole consul sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, and their witness did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We have heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even so did their yet not even so did their testimony agree. <clears throat> we will not take the time here, but there have been a number of occasions in which lawyers have written books. In fact, one wrote a two-volume series dealing with the legal aspects, according to Jewish law, of the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. And one of the rules in Jewish jurisprudence is that if the testimony of witnesses do not agree, that the prisoner shall be set free. In this case, these accusations did not agree, and yet Jesus was not freed. Uh, as uh, is often the case, people interpret what they hear in terms of their own ideas that already exist. By adding a few words to their testimony, they witnesses falsified the teachings of Jesus. They said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that's made with hands, and in three days I'll build another not made with hands. Um, they, the adding made with hands threw it off because as we find later, Jesus was talking about his own body. That his body was a temple that when they destroyed it, that he would then on the third day cause it to rise from the dead. But even then they couldn't agree on this particular testimony because they hadn't understood what he'd said. Read verse 60 through verse 62 in Mark chapter 14. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he was silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a, a fulfillment of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah had prophesied that as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And um, here Jesus is not answering his accusers. There are times when people are not open to reason and there's no point in trying to answer them. And this is one of those. And then he said, when the witnesses could not agree and Jesus would not incriminate himself, then he asked him point blank, do you claim to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of a coming prophet like Moses, a coming king like Jesus, um, a coming priest like Melchizedek. Are you the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one? And Jesus said, I am. And then made this amazing statement which requires the resurrection of the high priest. You will see the coming of the Son of Man with power. This can only be possible in case that after his death, now so long ago, nearly 2,000 years, that this man himself will be raised from the dead, even though unsaved, and will see the Son of Man as he comes in power with the clouds of heaven. We now find the trial takes a turn because they now dismiss the witnesses and they're going to try to condemn Jesus on his own testimony, which he has just given, verses 63 and 4. And the high priest tore his mantle and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him 
as deserving death. Now we're going to find as we proceed through the trial that uh, this will be the basis on which the Jewish trial is concluded. That Jesus, by claiming to be the Messiah, had made himself equal with God and therefore was guilty of blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy in the Old Testament law was that of death. And if what Jesus said was not true, then he was deserving of death. Now, if he had been judged and condemned and the Jews had been free to carry out their normal procedures, they would have stoned him. But they were now under the Romans. The Romans had a remarkable colonial po uh, policy. Uh, they were not <clears throat> any more oppressive than they needed to be to control the populace. They retained for Roman control four areas. First of all, they retained that of civil government. And this, of course, involved the police power. In connection with this police power, they retained the right of international relations. A person could send an embassy to Rome, but he could not send an embassy to Syria. The relations between Palestine and Syria were governed by the Roman Empire, which was over both. The um, power of taxation was reserved to the Romans. Now, they allowed a, another tax, like we would have a federal tax and a state tax in this country. They allowed the temple to also levy a tax upon the people. But the Roman tax came first. And then fourth, and important for our story here, they retained the death penalty, the power of capital punishment. Now, they would permit you to flog a man, to throw him in prison, to arrest him, uh, anything you wanted to do, except you couldn't kill him. For this, they had to receive Roman permission. Now, it is not a crime in the eyes of the Romans to blaspheme, especially against a Jewish god. And so this charge on which the Jews desired to have Jesus killed had no meaning to the Romans at all. So when the time comes that Jesus is going to be turned over from the Jewish authorities over to the Roman authorities, the charge is going to change. And this is going to be one of insurrection. So that Jesus now is going to be painted as a rebel who is in danger of overthrowing or trying to overthrow the Roman government and therefore must be dealt with on that grounds. We will therefore find that when the trial has so-called, mistrial actually, when the trial is concluded before Pilate and he has yielded to public demand that Jesus be crucified, that Pilate then put the charge against Jesus, as we'll see later, on the cross, that he was king of the Jews. And they put this in three languages. And the leaders objected to this. And the Pilate, you know, made that famous statement, what I've written, I've written. Uh, they wanted him to say that Jesus said he was king of the Jews. Pilate said, no, he's king. Behold your king. He was very sarcastic and, and about this. Now that the trial at this point has been concluded before the Sanhedrin, and by the way, the hour of the day makes it illegal. Uh, the, the law of the Jews forbid trial at night. But the Passover was coming. They had to get this passed not only by themselves, but by Pilate in order for the crucifixion to take place. And you will find that because of the very early hour in the morning, in just a moment, we're going to have the trial resume before Pilate, this must have been prearranged. Otherwise, they never would have been able to get Pilate up and out of bed and down at work, sitting in the governor's throne as a judge, except that he'd been approached earlier. In the meantime, however, now that Jesus is condemned on the basis of blasphemy, we continue to read in Mark 14, verse 65. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Now the details of that are given to us in Matthew. It says, in this word of prophesy, that is, he's blindfolded. And uh, they said, Name the man that struck you. You didn't see him, but you're a prophet. You claim to be the Son of the Most High. You claim to be the Messiah. You know everything. Who hit you? 